We have seen that the observational record shows rising global average temperatures. We have also seen that this rise is unusual. We have evidence that the rise in temperature since the Industrial Revolution has been accompanied by rising greenhouse gas concentrations, in particular carbon dioxide. The next question that we need to answer is how can we be sure that the rise in carbon dioxide is due to the burning of fossil fuels? This is a challenging question. It requires us to think deeply about the carbon cycle. Carbon is a constituent of all organic compounds, many of which are essential to life. The greatest physical reservoir of carbon is not atmospheric carbon dioxide, but instead is located in the Earth's crust and is not easily accessible to biological organisms. The source of virtually all carbon found in living organisms is CO2 either in the atmosphere or dissolved in water. The global carbon cycle can be viewed as a series of reservoirs of carbon in the Earth system which are connected by exchange fluxes of carbon. An exchange flux is the amount of carbon which moves between reservoirs each year. Before human activities, such as land use changes and industrial processes had had a significant impact, the global carbon cycle was roughly balanced. However, CO2 has increased by almost 50% from around 280 parts per million in 1750 to the current levels of over 415 parts per million. This figure shows the reservoirs and exchange fluxes of carbon in the global carbon cycle. The numbers represent carbon reservoirs in petagrams of carbon and the annual exchanges in petagrams of carbon per year. A petagram is equivalent to a billion metric tons. The black numbers and arrows show the pre-industrial reservoirs and fluxes. The red numbers and arrows show the additional fluxes caused by human activities, averaged over 2000 to 2009, which include emissions due to the burning of fossil fuels, cement production and land use change, in total about 9 petagrams of carbon per year. Some of this additional anthropogenic carbon is taken up by the land and the ocean, about 5 petagrams of carbon per year, while the remainder is left in the atmosphere, 4 petagrams of carbon per year, explaining the rising atmospheric concentrations of CO2. The red numbers in the reservoirs show the cumulative changes in anthropogenic carbon from 1750 to 2011. A positive change indicates that the reservoir has gained carbon. This accountancy of the carbon budget is difficult and fraught with uncertainty. The studies to estimate the exchange fluxes are some of the most challenging in Earth science. Not surprisingly, many climate change deniers have argued that these studies are flawed and do not show that burning fossil fuels has increased the atmospheric carbon reservoir. However, scientists have been able to conclusively show that the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is due to burning fossil fuels. And they did this indirectly by measuring the atmospheric concentrations of carbon-14. Carbon-14 is formed in the upper atmosphere through the impact of cosmic radiation. Carbon-14 is eventually oxidised to carbon dioxide and through photosynthesis is incorporated into the biosphere. Anything made of organic material will have carbon-14 present in its structure. This carbon-14 is radioactive and decays with a half-life of some 5,730 years. If we know the amount of carbon-14 as a function of time in the past, then we can use measurements of carbon-14 to date materials. This is the basis of radiocarbon dating. Hans Seuss, who we discussed earlier, realised that burning fossil fuels would dilute the amount of carbon-14 present in the atmosphere. This is because fossil fuels are devoid of carbon-14 as they are formed from the fossilised remains of animal and plant life that died hundreds of millions of years ago, primarily in the Carboniferous period. 
any carbon-14 originally present in the organic material of these dead animals and plants will have long ago decayed. Seuss recognised that the influence of this dilution would affect the accuracy of radiocarbon dating. More recently, the Seuss effect has been used to argue that the rise in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is due to burning fossil fuels. This figure shows the per mil change in carbon-14 containing atmospheric carbon dioxide since the end of the Second World War. The small dilution of carbon-14 in the shaded green area is the effect postulated by Seuss. As you can see, there was a dramatic rise in carbon-14 in the mid to late 1950s that continued until the early 1960s. This rise in the amount of carbon-14 was due to the open-air testing of atomic weapons. Following the signing of the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963, which prohibited nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere or underwater, we can see that the carbon-14 concentrations dropped dramatically. The mechanism for this drop was not radioactive decay. After all, carbon-14 has the half-life of 5,730 years, and so radioactive decay would not be noticeable on the timescale of this figure. Instead, the mechanism was due to the dilution through the burning of fossil fuel. The rate of decay can be shown to match exactly that which would be expected given the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide through the burning of fossil fuels. There is simply no other mechanism that can explain this decay in carbon-14. It should be noted that this human-caused disruption to the carbon-14 amounts in the atmosphere through the testing of nuclear weapons has often been cited to mark the transition from the Holocene to the current period in which humans have become a dominant force of global environmental change. The 1995 Nobel Prize winner, Paul Crutzen, coined the term Anthropocene to denote this current period. Thanks for listening.